Well, joining me now is Tom Evans. He was juror number 18 in the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. Tom, as we you know, gear up here for Chad Daybell's trial, flashback to a year ago. What were, what were you doing with your life? Do you remember when you got the jury summons in the mail? Uh, I do. It's all kind of a blur, though. <laughs> right. Tell me about that. So you get called into the courthouse. Had you done jury duty before? I'd never done jury duty before. I had no idea what the case was going into it. Um, I just thought it was like business at you, as usual at the courthouse. There were tons of jurors called in, but I didn't know they were all for one trial or I had no idea what was going on. And you advanced past the questionnaire phase and then the, uh, you know, where they then question you in person. So I believe it was a, Friday morning when they made like pick the actual jury and they went through and they're like, you know, yes, no, yes, no. What did you think when you found out you had been selected? I just remember sitting in the courtroom and I guess there were 18 of us and we were being questioned. Uh, um, actually there were more than that, but there were, it, it got boiled down to the 18 and I still didn't know that I was actually on the jury. I just thought we were just another group of, several groups until we were brought then into the um, jury room and they started giving us instructions on you know where we were going to get picked up and stuff like that and then it, and i think it was the same for some other people too then it just kind of dawned on us that we were actually on this jury it was shocking there, what did you know about the case beforehand not a whole lot i mean i knew i knew who Lori was um, I knew that the kids had been missing and found dead, uh, but I, I didn't know who Alex was or any of the other players. I think I probably would have recognized Chad or his name. That was about it. Right. So what would you describe? I know this is probably a really broad, big question, but how would you describe that six weeks there in the Ada County Courthouse every day? Uh, well, of course, it was really hard. Um, it, it wasn't a comfortable thing for me. Um, I'm used to being outside and I'm not, you know, used to hanging out inside a small room with a bunch of people or being in a courthouse or anything like that. So it wasn't really in my comfort zone. Um, and, you know, every day was different. There were days, of course, that were horrific. We had to see what we had to see and uh, hear what we had to hear and go through all of that. So that was really hard. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, day to day, take it one day at a time, get brought into the courthouse and something different every day. Was there a particular piece of evidence or witness or moment that you remember where you thought, okay, guilty? Everybody asked me that question and I still am not sure how to answer that except to say, um, no, there wasn't really one piece of evidence like they found her hair between the plastic and the duct tape on JJ's body that didn't mean that much to me because it's a mom's hair and it's going to be everywhere um, maybe some other jurors felt different about that I don't know but for me it was just an accumulation of things and actually what's weird to say is I think that a lot of the jurors that had been her friends people in her inner circle I think had more influence on me in making my decision than all of the the police and the FBI and the professional uh, people who testified. It was the the more personal witnesses versus the experts. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I believed all the expert testimony. They were those people were solid. They were thorough, and I think it's because I believed them so much that it came down more to. Do I believe Zulema or April or any of these other people? Right. Yeah, I, I interviewed another juror last year, and he pretty much told me the same thing, that it was those personal witnesses. And and I think as humans, maybe we, we relate more to that, at least on an emotional level. Um, but then if you've got the evidence to back it up, which the prosecutors did, I mean, that, that makes it a little bit more uh, confirming, I guess, when you come down with the verdict. I wouldn't say that I necessarily related to any of those, any of uh, the witnesses that had been her friends, though. 
Right, right. They were a little out there for the most part. Well, that leads to my next question. There would have had to be moments where you were thinking, what? You know, were, do you recall some of those? Like where you're like, what are they even talking about? I mean, I, I as I was re- in there reporting, having covered that story for three years, knowing a lot of the background, there were still moments where I had those, what? So I'm sure as a juror, not knowing much, there were many uh, confusing or perplexing moments. I felt like I was behind the curve the whole time trying to catch up. Mm. And the frustrating part was, I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't ask any questions. I couldn't even talk to other jurors about the case during breaks or anything. So I had to just take what they gave me, try to comprehend what that was, and you know, just try to understand it all. Right. Yeah, that is the thing. You you can't clarify anything because you can't ask those questions. I'm so, still trying to do that. I'm still trying to understand a lot of it. Right. With those questions now, are you are you planning to watch Chad Daybell's trial? I plan to be there, maybe not every day, but most days I will be at the trial. At the trial. So are you hoping to maybe get some of those questions answered or at least maybe more understanding? I am. I'm definitely hoping that. I think um, the prosecution says that there will be more. Um, I don't know if they held back or they just have new information or what, but there's going to be more information come out that hopefully will be like more layers peeled off the onion, uh, getting closer to understanding how it is that this could have happened in the first place. Right. Well, and one of the big differences is there will actually be a defense. And when you were on the jury, were you anxious for the defense to speak? I mean, were you finally like, okay, now we get to hear the other side? And what were your thoughts when they said, we don't have one in in so many words. By the time it was got to that point, honestly, I, I was so relieved that when uh, Jim Archibald stood up and I forget what his exact words were, but basically we don't have a defense. <laughs> uh, that was a relief for me. I, I guess I was kind of looking forward to what they would have had to say and what witnesses they would have called. Um, and I, I would have, maybe like to see a little bit more cross-examining of some of the witnesses, maybe some more fireworks. But I don't think there was any of that to be had. I don't think they had anything they could have done or said or any witnesses they could have called that would have helped her case at all. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would have been a different trial if Lori had allowed them to do their job, you know? Right. Yeah. But she didn't. And by all accounts, Chad Daybell will allow John Pryor to do that. And he has said that there'll be expert witnesses and whatnot. So um, that'll be, that'll be, I would imagine that will be kind of fascinating for you to be in the courtroom, but on the other side, you know, in the gallery where all of us were sitting as a spectator. Oh yeah. And I'll get to talk to you guys during breaks and I don't have to, you know, sit in the jury room and not talk about the case. Right. That's awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. What was the hardest part of being a juror in such a long, uh, devastating case? Um, so it's been a year, right? And I'm just now kind of looking back on that and thinking about it and realizing that I think it it took more of an emotional toll on me than I realized at the time. People who know me, who are close to me, um, they tell me now, and they told me then, but I didn't really understand it then, but they tell me I wasn't the same. I haven't been the same, and I'm just starting to get back to myself. Yeah. Which is crazy. I mean, I didn't realize that, and it, for it to take a year, to, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced a lot of that yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah, you're right. It does. And and um, I remember my first day back at work, here in Idaho Falls. I mean, you guys had your verdict Friday. Thank you for that, by the way, not carrying it over the weekend. And I came home Saturday, Sunday was Mother's Day, and I was sitting at my desk Monday morning and I just thought, what am I going to do now? I mean, because you're, right. you're you're so intense for that, you know, two month period. Um, right. Did Did your wife, did your family, did your friends, were they following the trial as you were on the jury? My wife, for sure. And, and yeah, a lot of my friends, too. But my wife, every day, was paying attention to what was going on. And we couldn't talk about it when I got home. 
but she was always there for me. Um, we would go on a hike or, you know, try to do something to kind of take my mind off of it. She was great. What do you think for this trial? What, what would be your, I don't know if I want to say advice or suggestions. What would you say to the prosecutors as far as, you know, having been in that one of those 12 seats, well, 18 seats is, is with the alternates. Uh, what do they need to do to, to effectively make their case? So they asked me the same question. I, I got the opportunity to interview them after the sentencing, preparing for my book. And they asked me that too. And I don't know what else they could do. It's, it's such a convoluted case. If anything, I think maybe outline the case a little more clearly. But when I look back on the transcripts of the case, I see that they did that. And somehow I just wasn't able to really keep up with it in real time. So maybe slow that down just a little bit and make it a little bit more clear to the jurors um, what their case is going in. Yeah. I, I, again, I thought the same thing for you all is it, because I was familiar with the story as I'm reporting it and they're bringing in all these names and locations and uh, <laughs> especially on the days of the GPS pings and all that, when it can get pretty oh, yeah. technical. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, and, and, you know, some of those warm afternoons, I, I felt for you there in the jury box. Uh, what about the defense? Would you say anything to the defense? Oh, uh, Listening to some of the pretrial hearings, if I had some advice to give the defense, it would be maybe don't talk on so long and try to make points that people already get <laughs> to Mr. Pryor. You know, that's, I don't know, that, that would be the only thing I have to say to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there any uh, any interesting behind the scenes little nuggets or things that you can share with us? Um, I've been working on my book, uh, the, uh, the first book about the, uh, um, Laurie Daybell trial is done. It's in editing right now with my publisher. Yeah. Tell everybody, tell everybody the name of the book. Yeah. It's money, power, and sex. The Laurie Vallow Daybell trial by juror number 18. And we'll show a graphic here. This was done by Lisa Cheney, the, the graphic artist yeah. that the, the media we hired to do, uh, uh, sketches because there were not cameras in which this case we won't need a uh, sketch artist because there are cameras what made you decide to write a book tom you know by the time the trial was over um there were two things that just were really struck me one was that i wanted to try to get something good out of the trial i wanted to try to do something can't make up for all the things that happened but try to do something that's positive so I thought, I'm not an author, but there's a story to tell here. I'm going to write a book and I'm going to donate the profits to some charity, which I can talk about that later. But I didn't have a charity picked out at the time, but I thought it's got to be something that helps children. And then the other thing was um, when I went into this trial, it, it started out being so dark for me and depressing and sad and you know all negative. But by the time it was over, I actually was honored to do my service as a juror. And I was proud of the judicial system and the police, the FBI, how everybody had worked together, the prosecution. Um, and I really felt like I needed to tell that story. You know, after all the news that we've been watching over this last four or five years, defunding the police and all the negative things that have happened in our country that we've seen, this turned out to be something positive for me. Well, that's an interesting take because, you know, there are some jurors that say, I never want to do it again. And they're not sitting through murder cases involving children. Um, so that it's it's nice that you were able to find the positive aspects and then write this book. And now you have found a, a charity to donate your proceeds to. Yes, it's called Hope House. Um, it's out in Marsing and they take kids in from all over the world, um, you know, any child that's in need and danger they'll take them in and provide a home um, and it's, it's really great it's a christian organization but it's not affiliated with any particular church it's um you don't have strings attached with the federal government so you know they aren't they're guided by those kind of things mm -hmm. um, and they just do really good work there 
we got to go out and tour it and meet the directors and take a look at it. And as far as I can tell, everything is really positive. The other charities that we looked into, we looked into several of them. They all had some kind of defect that kept us from wanting to give them money. Mm. Okay, so people are going to want to know when the book comes out. It can't come out until the Chad Daybell trial is over. So it's ready to be released, um, or it will be, um, as soon as that trial, as soon as there's a verdict is in, it's going to be released. So, you know, end of May, sometime in June, okay. whatever that is. All right. So there's your summer read. It'll be ready for the summer. Um, Tom, what would you say overall about, has this changed your opinion of like true crime type of shows? Were you into those? Were you into documentaries, podcasts before this? And has it changed? I never really was that into it. I mean, I've liked, I always like to read <clears throat> like Anne Roll books or whatever, some true crime stuff. But I never got into it like all the stuff that's on TV nowadays. I'm still really not. If it doesn't have to do with this case, I'm not interested. I watch you. I watch uh, Lauren Mathias. All, but when it when it's uh, has to do with a different case, no interest. And maybe that's because I'm so deep into our case that I don't really want to get distracted by something else. Mm -hmm. Not sure. Right. So you did 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 you go back after the trial and like? Actually, the day the verdict came down, there was a dateline that night. Did you watch it? Um, I don't remember if I watched it that night, but yeah, I've watched everything that I can find about the trial. So you went back and watched the Netflix show, all of them? Yeah, all the stuff that I hadn't seen and didn't get to watch before. Wow. And then I started to get a little bit of understanding of everything that I was told. It started to make sense. You, ha you had the uh, quick learn as much as you can version, whereas most of us have had three or four years to kind of put it together. But right. even then I, I still, you know, I'm stunned at what I forget or what I remember. And obviously yeah. there'll be a lot more here in the next, you know, eight weeks or so. There's Are so you much. relieved that, te that uh, Lori's trial was not a death penalty case? Would that have changed, you know, your mind being a juror? It's really strange to think about that. And toward the end of the trial, you know, when there was just downtime, I remember sitting there contemplating that. I don't know why I was, because we were not confronted with that. Um, but it would have been a big deal. I, I'm pretty, um, I, if, if somebody does the things that they did, they deserve to die as far as I'm concerned. And I, I'm all for the death penalty in that way, but still, it would have been tough. I would have had a hard time dealing with that. And when I'm actually confronted with that, it changes my thinking on the death penalty a little bit. And I'm really concerned about the jurors and the Chad Daybell trial. Hmm. But, having, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, having gone through what I went through, I have, a, I know a little bit about how much of an effect it's going to have on them. And they're going to be faced with the death penalty. And I think that's going to be a whole a whole different level for them right but you would have had no issue but maybe let me make sure i'm understanding you correctly you would have had no issue putting Lori vallow to death exactly i would have had no issue i would have done it but i think it would have cost me something mm. but yeah. based on the evidence and everything you saw you would have been fine with it no problem yeah yeah I've absolutely been able to do it and and I know some have said that perhaps that that would be a harder decision versus the guilty not guilty decision. It would be, yeah, because it goes back to the jury in a death penalty case. They have to sentence, not the judge. The jury actually has to sentence um, the defendant to death, and I think that would just be a really hard thing to do. Right. What would you say to people watching that are you know? just getting into this new trial, maybe they they just found out about the case or maybe they watched the Lori Vallow case. What should we be watching for? Or, or better yet, what are you going to be watching for? I'm just going to be watching for new information that we didn't get. Because now that I've done all the research and um, I don't know as much as somebody like you or you know some of the other people who've been following this case the whole time, but I know as much as I could possibly soak in in the year since the trial has ended. Um, and I know there's more. I have unanswered questions. There's so much more. The main, 
question being how does somebody like Chad and Lori, how did they get to a point where they're able to do the things that they did? You know, why is pretty easy. How is a little harder to understand. So yeah. that's what I've pointed a lot. That's what I write about a lot. And hopefully we're getting some answers, but I think we have a little ways to go and hopefully the Chad trial will help with that. Right. Right. Hopefully it'll help. Maybe it'll make it even more frustrating that there isn't that answer, you know, because yeah, right. still, so the human mind, I think we want, we want to understand, we want to at least have some sort of reasoning as to the why. And I guess yeah. the prosecutor said it with Lori, money, sex, power, but still right. there's the deeper why. And the interesting thing to me is, so they said it was Lori, now they're going to say it was Chad. You know, you say one thing to one juror, then you say jury, and then you say something different to another jury that contradicts what you said to the other jury. But it's not really that way. After thinking it all out, they're not contradicting when they say that because Chad was the religious guru leader. And that kind of makes him, even though it's, it's hard to explain, but even though Lori was responsible for the murder of her children, Chad is kind of responsible for Lori and having it go through her and then down through Alex and the actual murder. So, right. Yeah. That that's, that'll be an interesting point. It will be interesting to see the different tactics the prosecutors use in this case versus, you know, Chad's, will they do a lot of the same stuff? As you said, there is more, we don't know. I mean, we haven't seen a lot of what's well, on Chad Daybell's hard drives. We saw Lori's and again, it's a whole new game with, the defense. This is a different attorney. This is this is different. Granted, he did get a sneak preview. John Pryor did of of the trial because he was at Lori's almost every day. Um, but yeah, it's it's a, it'll be a whole new mix, and it'll be interesting to see as jury selection continues through the weeks. You know what? Who ends up making that jury? Right. I wonder how long it's going to take them. Yeah, it might take a little longer this time around. I imagine so, especially once you get into the death penalty type questions, uh, people's views on that. Uh, Tom, is there anything you want to add? Anything I didn't ask you that you want to touch on? Oh, um, I don't know. It's just been an interesting year. I feel like I'm finally coming back to myself. Um, it's amazing to me that it takes that long for that to happen. But uh, things are good. I'm working on the second book. Um, I'm pretty well into that but i can't i have a ways to go because the trial needs to happen before i can write about it so yeah right. um i did want to ask you tom you know with the the graphic images and the evidence and everything were counseling services offered to jurors at the end of the trial they were um the court offered to pay for counseling you would have to go out and find your own counseling and the court would pay for that and I know that some jurors uh, are doing that. I, I did not. I, maybe I should have looking back, but I don't think I need to now at this point. But I think it's been therapy for me, just doing all the research that I've done, getting to know a lot of the people involved in the case and uh, and writing about it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think everybody handles and deals with grief and trauma differently. We know that. Yeah. But being on a jury, being in that courtroom every day for six weeks is a, is a trauma when you're seeing the stuff you see. And you mentioned that you didn't expect it to affect you that way as I did not either. I mean, it, it was, yeah. it, it just, you know, affects you differently as a reporter, as you're covering it. So that's well, good that th those services are provided. Yeah. And I think about people like you and I think about the, the police who had to do all this firsthand and I'm so much further removed than a lot of people are. A lot of people had to deal with it a lot more closely than I did. And I worried about those people too. Yeah, I'll never forget that the day after that the children's bodies were discovered, I was driving around the property. It was still closed off to the public, so we couldn't get close. But, you know, through the long uh, view from where we were, you you could see, and, and I heard accounts of officers sifting through dirt to yeah. find any sort of human remain in the hot summer sun. I mean, it's just that they're out there on their hands and knees in the dirt. So yeah, I, imagine the effect on those guys. I, yeah, you know, after the sentencing, I went to the sentencing in Rexford 
And when it was actually on my way down there, I was driving by myself. Um, my wife had planned to come with me, but I ended up going on my own because our grandson was due to be born that night. So she stayed home. And anyway, so I made that long drive by myself, contemplating the whole thing. And on the way into Rexburg, I decided I, I need to go drive by Chad Bill's house. So I went out there. I pulled over in the little turnout there and sat there by myself for maybe half an hour, an hour, just looking over and thinking about what everybody had to go through that day. Um, and it was just kind of somber and sad. And then I went back to the hotel, ran into two of my fellow jurors who were there for the sentencing too, and they wanted to go back out. So I thought, well, you know, I don't really want to go back out there, but I'll, I'll go back out there with them. So we went out there and this time, the little turnout that I pulled out and, and sat there by myself earlier was full of people. You may have been there, I don't remember, but the media was out there, they're interviewing Kay and Larry, who I had talked to on the phone, but hadn't met yet. So we got out and we stood there and waited for things to wind down a little bit. And then Kay and Larry approached us and thanked us and hugged us. And it just, it was just striking to me how, you know, a couple hours earlier, I was out there by myself feeling sad. And then, then the next time I go out there, you know, it was so warm and caring. Yeah. So that, that's just kind of a little bit of a synopsis or whatever about how it kind of turned things around for me. Yeah, the, I've heard that from so many people associated to the case, even the, with the case, even the police, you know, saying that it's the most perfect thing you'll ever cover. But there's also really positive, good friendships that have been formed and relationships and whatnot um yeah. yeah well thank you for your service for serving on the jury and to all of your other jurors and my honor um it it, it, it i look forward to reading your book and look forward to seeing you here at the trial most days and uh awesome anything anything else you want to say tom i think that's about it thank you for interviewing me and